Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to One Health Week. And, and today we're particularly happy to celebrate the fifth Global One Health Day. I know it's also election day and I'm especially pleased you joined us. Hopefully you voted with One Health in mind. This means prioritizing well-being and recognizing that the well-being of people and society is interconnected to the well-being of plants and animals and to the environment. I'm pleased to introduce Hannah Cornell, a graduate student in the public policy program, who will be pre presenting today. Her talk is titled Behind Closed Doors, COVID-19's Impact on Violence Against Women and Children. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Tanya. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into things. Like Tanya said, I am Hannah Cornell. I'm an MPP uh, student here at Del Val. I also work at Mission Kids Child Advocacy Center in Montgomery County. I am the Sex Trafficking Response Team Project Manager there. Um, just to give you a bit of background about myself and sort of where this uh, presentation was born out of. Um, so with that being said, I am going to jump into the presentation and share my screen. All right, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so again, I just wanna thank you for joining us. I know it's election day, there's lots of feelings and maybe a little stress accompanied with that. So I appreciate you joining. Um, and before I get started into the actual content, I always just wanna be sure anytime we're talking about something that is difficult, um, maybe emotionally for some folks, talking about child sexual abuse, sex trafficking, um, assault, I want to give a disclaimer uh, that maybe this might be activating or triggering for some folks. So I will say that is the benefit of maybe some online learning is that um, if you are feeling activated or triggered by some of the things that we're discussing today, please feel free to just take a step back, practice some good self-care, um, take a deep breath, step outside if you need to. So I just want to preface that before we jump into things. So I want to first start out talking about what is the problem. Um, we're going to focus on what the problem is, really defining that problem, um, and then talking about some trends that are being seen during COVID and how we can address this issue. Um, so the problem is that violence is being perpetrated against women and children at an increasing rate since the outbreak of COVID. So um, I'm sure maybe some of you have heard the term violence against women and children, um, but I want to break that down and be sure we know what that means and really clearly define that. Sometimes we, we throw buzzwords around, especially in like the social service field that I work in, where we say trauma-informed or victim-centered violence against women. But if we sit there and sort of sit with that word and break it down, we think, well, what exactly does that mean? So I just want to unpack that a bit. Um, the United Nations defines violence against women as an act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women. And this includes girls as well. And including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or private life. So that is a mouthful. And I just wanna break that down, thinking through one of the main points here that sometimes people might skip over is that some keywords here are likely to result in and including threats. So violence and um, sexual psychological harm that can be perpetrated and that certainly falls under the category of violence against women, but also simply the threat of violence, the threat of taking action qualifies as violence against women and children. So we see this sort of overarching umbrella, violence against women and children. But let's break that down a little bit more. What makes up violence against women and children? That's domestic violence, intimate partner violence, the abuse of children, and human trafficking. There are a couple other things um, that fall even within those categories. We could go further into detail, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm really gonna focus on domestic violence, um, intimate partner violence, uh, maltreatment of children, and human trafficking. So again, being very clear about what the terms are, breaking this down even more, domestic violence is the abuse or assault of a family member or a current or past household member or a current past dating partner. So um, domestic violence, within that category of domestic violence, we see there's intimate partner violence. So that's a form of domestic violence, which just refers to the abuse of a current or past partner. So it's just a specific component of domestic violence. 
We know that child abuse can also be a form of domestic violence, but that's only when it occurs within the household. We certainly know that while child children are very often abused by somebody within the household, they can certainly and are often abused outside of the household, unfortunately through institutions, whether that's an educational, religious institution, civic institution. We know the Boy Scouts was a, a recently a huge case uh, that was broken. Um, and that falls within child maltreatment. So that's the physical, sexual, psychological, and emotional violence perpetrated against children. And we also know that that term encompasses neglect of children and infants by um, a caregiver or authority figure. And lastly, human trafficking is the use of fraud, force, or coercion to compel a person into commercial sex acts. So that's sex trafficking and the use of force, fraud, or coercion um, to get somebody to uh, follow through with services or labor, which is labor trafficking. So now that we have this uh, pretty thorough definition of what violence against women and children looks like, why is this important? So if we're looking at it um, from sort of purely an economic standpoint or a cost perspective, we can certainly see the numbers here up on the screen. In the US, medical expenses um, related to intimate partner violence directly result in an expense of $5.8 billion a year, which is absolutely mind-blowing statistic and an incredible cost. We know if we're taking a step back from the US and we're looking at the cost of violence against women worldwide, that's estimated to be one to four percent of our global GDP. So we know this is incredibly costly um, from a financial perspective. We know that as violence and women, violence against women and children increases, the costs associated with the issue um, are going to be exacerbating the economic, the negative uh, economic impacts of COVID. Right. So as COVID's economic impacts increase and violence against women increases, we're seeing sort of this. Uh, co-occurring uh, strain on the economy. But taking a step back um, from a purely cost perspective, it's important, and in my opinion, it's, it's most important because it's a gross violation of human rights. Um, nobody should be victimized by violence. Um, and for that in itself, it is an absolutely very important and worthwhile uh, subject to discuss. And my first point here is that um, unpacking the detriment that it does uh, to the individual, to women, to children, is that victims or violence are more likely to experience negative physical and psychological health outcomes. So we know that people's lives are absolutely um, irreparably shaped by the trauma that they experience. So physical, whether that's uh, gastrological, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, heart disease, traumatic brain injuries, um, those are all very significant and psychologically we see post-traumatic stress disorder, um, panic disorder, depression, right? So the personal, psychological, and physical cost to individual victims is also tremendous. So before I jump into some trends that we're seeing as a direct result of COVID, um, I want to first preface this by saying that violence against women uh, was a global pandemic before the outbreak of COVID. So one in three, you can see up on the screen, one in three women have experienced physical and sexual violence at some point in their lives. One out of three, that is an incredibly startling and disheartening percentage of women who have experienced um, physical or sexual assault. Right, so we can, we can sit with that and we can sit with COVID also being this global pandemic and we can say, and we can use COVID hopefully as an opportunity to shine a light that this issue needs to be addressed. That this was long an issue much before COVID exacerbated the issue and that it's something that is warranting of a very comprehensive response. So in that way, I'd like to view it as an opportunity sort of from this very positive lens that, okay, COVID is really shining a light that this is a problem in our society. So hopefully we can use this momentum and we can get this on the agenda and start making changes to impact our local, our national and our world community. So let's look at some of the global trends specifically related to COVID. 
right? So there's a lot of stuff on the screen right now, but if I were to sum this all up, it's that intimate partner violence, domestic violence, violence against women and children, it is all increasing and it's increasing tremendously. So we see globally, sort of scanning the breadth of um, the world, we see in Asia, we see China, domestic violence rates uh, tripled during lockdown in February. We see in Singapore, calls have increased to their domestic violent hotline, domestic violence hotline by 33%. In Europe, um, there are even more stats in Italy and Spain, but specifically France, we see domestic violence rates increasing by 30%. We see UK increasing by 20, 25% to their domestic violence hotline. And something that's really notable is that they received a 150% increase in hits following stay at home orders to their website. That is absolutely tremendous considering that many victims are not able to maybe speak audibly on the phone and communicate that. So people are really getting online to access, or to access resources and support. Um, we see in South America and Brazil reports uh, of a 40 to 50% increase for domestic violence. Similarly in Argentina and then in Africa, we also see in Kenya, Nigeria, and several, several other um, nations in Africa, and notably um, South Africa has also experienced a huge increase um, in violence against women and children. So breaking this down even more, like specifically focusing on the United States, uh, there's certainly a lot of research that is emerging as we speak, and it's difficult because there are different trends observed throughout the United States. But we can take that data and say generally the states in the US have seen a 21 to 35 percent increase in domestic violence since lockdown. We see cities like Portland, San Antonio, New York, they have all experienced significant increase in calls. We see places um, in the south in Alabama, uh, in Jefferson County, 27 percent increase. Right, so I, I feel like I'm repeating myself over and over again. We're just seeing a tremendous increase um, in hotline calls of people in need trying to seek um, resources and support. The sexual assault hotline increase, but something that's very notable and important, and which we'll get into in the later half of this presentation, is that of half of the calls um, that they received, these calls came from children, they came from minors, and 79% of the minors who called the sexual assault hotline um, reported that they're actually living with their perpetrator. So this is really unprecedented. I know we use that word a lot in these times, um, but it's something really notable that researchers picked up on that normally when a child is experiencing sexual assault or abuse, an adult um, is picking up on that and they're calling that into Pennsylvania's child abuse hotline called Childline. So normally it's not actually a child making um, the call to report their abuse. So this is something that's very different that's emerging that we're seeing um, as a result of COVID as kids aren't able to get out and engage with adults who might have otherwise picked up on these red flags and reported um, sexual assault. Um, themselves. So we'll, I'll unpack that a little bit um, later, but that is really something that is interesting that's coming out of this research right now. 106% increase um, of global reports. I think Interpol reported this, a suspected child uh, sexual exploitation to their cyber tip line um, right now as children are more online than ever. Traffickers, um, perpetrators, they're taking advantage of that, knowing that kids are very vulnerable and isolated and knowing that they're using technology now more than ever, they are increasingly targeting children online. So we're seeing a huge increase um, of child sexual exploitation and child sexual exploitation imagery online right now. Um, in the National Human Trafficking Hotline, they reported a 40% increase in crisis cases following lockdown orders. And the important word in there, like for me, when I'm looking at this is that it's crisis cases, right? So these are the calls that are coming into the hotline that are specifically saying action has to be taken right now because there's a safety concern. I don't have housing, I'm experiencing homelessness. Um, 
or law enforcement needs to be involved. So that, that sort of falls under what is known as a crisis case. So that's pretty significant um, that they're seeing a 40% increase in just those calls for um, crisis cases. So we've looked at global, we see what's happening in the world, we see sort of overall what's happening in the US, um, but really looking locally, what our community is experiencing. Obviously there's not quite as much, much research um, much research in this area, but there has been some really good data that's been gathered um, in Montgomery County by the district attorney's office and the detectives bureau there. And basically what they saw is since the emergence of COVID, Montgomery County has seen an eight to 9% increase in domestic violence incidences. So if I'm sort of looking at that number um, and I'm considering it purely from like a numerical standpoint and not a very personal um, <laughs> person focused standpoint I'm saying eight to nine, no, it's not incredibly huge gap. But if we're really breaking that down and thinking about the individuals, we're thinking about each person and the ripple effect that that has um, on the individual, on the family, on the family system, on the community, that's a big impact. And even looking at that further, our Montgomery County stats break down that that breaks down to be about 40 incidences per day. So it's 40 cases per day at an eight to 9% increase. So that is still very, very significant. We also see Philadelphia's domestic violence hotline seeing about the same. I think a lot of the numbers I mentioned in the United States were about 30 or so percent. Um, so we're seeing something very similar as well in Philadelphia. So the last point here, is interesting. Um, if we're looking at this just sort of from a, an initial perspective, we're seeing, oh, Montgomery County, they're seeing a decline in child abuse reports. Chester County, same, Philadelphia, all of their child abuse reports are decreasing. That's good, that means child abuse is decreasing. Um, but if we take a step back and we really analyze this, um, goes to the point that I mentioned before is that um, kids are reporting their own abuse to a sexual assault hotline. Kids aren't getting out. They're not being seen by other individuals at the rate they were prior to lockdown. And therefore these reports are not being made. Experts unanimously agree that child abuse is increasing during COVID, but the rate of report has decreased significantly. The number one source of reports for child line in the state of Pennsylvania are school employees. And we know, unfortunately, that school staff is not really able to have those casual conversations with kids or to be able to see bruises or burns on their legs, right? So you're seeing the small little box um, of a kid who might be engaging in some remote or distance learning. And how willing do we think that that child is uh, to disclose their abuse when their perpetrator might be downstairs or in the next room over. So we are seeing a, declean, uh, a decline in child abuse reports, but I can confidently say that we are unfortunately not seeing a decline in child abuse. So the term unprecedented times has definitely been thrown out a lot. It's hard to compare what we're going through to prior and past events. But it is important to sort of look back on past events that might be somewhat similar and use that as a guidepost to really help us inform our policy action, help us inform how we're gonna respond to this um, growing shadow pandemic, right? This pandemic of violence that's occurring um, alongside the COVID pandemic. So we can look at maybe past times of economic insecurity. And one thing that is somewhat similar is we can look at the Great Recession um, that we had a few years back in 2008, and we can see like, what is the research saying happened during this time of economic insecurity? And we see that at the same time, child abuse and intimate partner violence was rising. We see that economic insecurity and factors like um, unemployment, mortgage foreclosure rates, those are directly um, correlated with an increase in child abuse specifically. So we can use that to say, okay, and get, get a guide and compare that to what's going on today. We also see that regions that were impacted by um, outbreaks of disease of different viruses, so Ebola, cholera, and Zika virus, we see that there's an increased rate of domestic violence um, and in decrease in gender equality. 
when those regions were impacted by diseases, which is something that we can somewhat compare to COVID, of course. Again, it is unprecedented. It's very difficult to perfectly compare these two things. Um, violence against women has also consistently been observed following uh, significant natural disasters. So Hurricane Katrina, um, the earthquake in Haiti, the fires in Australia, all um, have been found through data to show that there's an increase in violence against women and children. So just sort of considering what is going on with COVID, right? What are the factors that are directly tied to COVID that are increasing this violence? So we see that there's a problem. We see that violence is growing, but why is it directly tied to COVID? And some of those reasons I just mentioned, right? Um, economic insecurity, but let's unpack those a little bit more and understand and really get at the root of why um, violence against women and children is increasing during this time. So one of the major things that I would attribute uh, to an increase in violence is the quarantine and social isolation. Well, of course, this is absolutely very, very necessary um, to help prevent the spread of COVID. We see that there are some really difficult repercussions um, for victims of abuse. And one of the quotes that I feel like just really perfectly encapsulates uh, what happened, I just want to read this for you because I feel like it, it's so well said. Many victims are currently facing a worst case scenario, finding themselves trapped in the home with a violent perpetrator during a time of severely limited contact with the outside world. So that really sums it up. A lot of victims, whether they're adults, whether they're children, they're spending increasing time, one, in the home with possibly their perpetrator, they're spending time where they can't get a reprieve from their perpetrator. They can't have that sort of break and find strength maybe in their friends, uh, their family, religious institutions, whether that's a church, a synagogue, a mosque, um, to have that break away from the perpetrator. And also in those times, having other people identify maybe some red flags about what's going on to help them or make that report. And so not only are they, they spending so much more time with their perpetrator, they're not able to get out um, for other people to maybe recognize the signs. Um, especially we see, we're seeing this with children, like I mentioned with the school scenario, right? So kids might be living with their perpetrator and they're just not able to get out to all of the things they're doing outside of the home prior to COVID, right? School, extracurriculars, so many things going on. And that was all pretty much just removed. Um, and, and some people might push back and say, well, what about technology? Technology is a really great tool. Um, I 100% I agree. I think that we can absolutely use technology to connect um, with people who might be isolated and might be victimized. But I would just maybe push back a little bit and say, well, I 100% agree that this can be a useful tool. I would caution that a lot of perpetrators um, are very controlling of people's technology, um, are very controlling of victims' technology. So while they might have access to technology, um, they might ha not have privacy through that technology. So it's just something to consider. So factors driving the increase in violence related to COVID, stress. I'm sure that everyone on this call can relate with the feeling of increased stress during COVID. I know I certainly can. Um, but for one of the things that we're seeing is it's all of this stress, all of the factors I mentioned before, paired with this big old stress storm that's brewing, right? It's coming together to create the situation um, of unhealthy coping mechanisms that often resort in an increase of violence. So we see economic stress is really big right now. Um, we know that females are facing higher rates of unemployment, largely because layoffs are occurring in female dominated sectors like the leisure um, industry or hospitality services. So oftentimes women who are faced with unemployment in these times have to become more dependent on uh, somebody on their abuser, on somebody who's perpetrating violence against them. The same um, with kids when their parents or caretakers are experiencing economic stress, like I mentioned before, that's certainly been seen um, as people relating uh, 
having more like violent coping mechanisms. We see an increase, specific studies say an increase in spanking and increase in beatings for children when their parents are feeling um, the stress of maybe job insecurity or housing insecurity. So health related stress, um, I'm sure that people can relate feeling stressed physically in the sense of, do I have COVID? What's going on? Um, mental health is certainly taking a toll. So that's factoring into things as well. And then workload related stress, increase in domestic workload. So as you're spending more time in the home, um, maybe you have kids and your kids are not having their routine, the kids are in the house more. Um, so you're having to take on a lot more work um, with less routine a lot of times. So all of these stresses are compounding and they're compounding in this domestic sphere that we're sort of tied to right now with lockdown orders and it's leading to unhealthy coping mechanisms that increase violence. So we've seen a huge increase in alcohol sales um, in the United States and people aren't consuming this alcohol as regularly outside of the home in bars or restaurants as often, they're consuming it more so in the home. Um, we've seen a huge sale uh, of guns, a huge increase in the sale of guns in the United States since the outbreak of COVID. So we're having an increase in stress, we're having an increase in unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, and these things, whether that's alcoholism or gun sales, they're all found to increase a risk of violence. And even more so, there are still more factors that are just really causing COVID to have this incredible impact on our rates of violence against women and children. We see virus specific forms of violence. I know some of my colleagues at Laurel House in uh, Montgomery County, the domestic violence shelter there, they've reported victims um, being fed misinformation by their perpetrators, uh, telling them that if they go outside, uh, they will get the virus, they can't leave the house, um, pretending that they've infected the victim with the virus um, to keep them away from family and friends. So we now know that the virus can actually be used as a type of violence uh, against victims. A breakdown in social infrastructure and general unrest, we're seeing all of this because of COVID and that is directly related to increases in violence. We're also just generally seeing a lot of social unrest following the murders of uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Um, the election is today, right? So there's a lot of social unrest uh, going on in our society right now. And that has been shown to certainly increase a risk of, of violence within the domestic sphere. Uh, reducing funding for health and social services. This is something that we're seeing hotlines, crisis centers, shelters, legal aid, all these protective services for victims, a lot of them are being cut back right now. Um, health providers, they oftentimes don't have access right now, understandably, because COVID is taking precedence. A lot of times they don't have time to dedicate to really engaging with possible victims uh, of abuse in making those necessary referrals. Um, and we're just seeing a decrease in coordinated response between disciplines as um, people are moving to remote work, um, as referral sources are sort of breaking down, we're not sure who to make the referral to. Um, if an agency has shut its doors for the time, a lot of nonprofits are struggling right now. Um, people are moving remotely, sometimes you you were able to go to court for a little bit. So things have just been very uh, flip side down. I'm sure everyone can relate to that due to COVID, but just really there's been a lack of a coordinated response, especially um, initially after, after COVID hit. I will say um, I made this presentation a, a little while ago, but I've certainly seen an increase in the coordinated responses as, as people have sort of gotten used to this new normal. Um, but initially there certainly was a decrease in a coordinated response. So all of that being said, I realize that's like a lot of heavy stuff. It's, it's at least in my opinion and sort of how I relate, it, it feels so big. It feels like such a big problem that it's difficult to really know where to begin to start. Um, and I certainly think that this issue is so big. It was pervasive. It was a pandemic before the pandemic. Um, 
that it requires a truly multifaceted solution. Um, so looking at some of the ways that we can respond on a global uh, scale and a national scale, certainly a statewide scale, um, we can talk about increasing rather than decreasing funding for social and health services to respond to this issue. Uh, beginning to consider these services as essential services, which require funding and certainly require uh, flexible funding. Uh, funding shelter resources, this is absolutely a huge issue. I know across the United States, in the state of Pennsylvania, there's just not enough shelter resources for folks. Um, before the outbreak of COVID, all 600 beds in Philadelphia's domestic violence shelters were full. Following COVID, we talked about that there was an increase in domestic violence. Those beds are still full and there's a demand now more than ever. So really investing in our shelter resources. Being able to provide protective and technological equipment um, to people who are on the ground providing these services to victims. I can speak um, from my experience at Mission Kids Child Advocacy Center. I know putting out a lot of messages uh, to folks and thankfully we have really great donors at Mission Kids, but putting out the word, hey, we need more masks for, for kids who are coming here to be interviewed. Um, we were looking for our laptops to adjust to remote work, right? So all of these things, um, if we can provide people who are on the ground doing this work with the tools they need, um, that's super important to continue moving forward with that coordinated response. Um, I really already touched on this, but just improving the overall multidisciplinary response. Um, and when I say multidisciplinary, I mean like healthcare providers or social service, victim service, uh, legal providers and law enforcement, right? The people who come together and who are really first responders um, to the issue of violence against women and children. So continuing to improve that multidisciplinary team response. Um, like I mentioned, now that some places have closed their doors, now that some people have gone remote, really meeting and hashing out and establishing clear guidelines. What do we do when we can't go into court? How do we adjust? And again, I will say, that from the time that I created this presentation, there has absolutely, and I can speak to my own experience in Montgomery County, um, there's been a really quick response in seeing how motivated our multidisciplinary team members are to respond to this issue and take the time and have meaningful conversations about how to establish those clear guidelines. It was really, really pivotal. Training around identifying victims. Um, of course, if we're training our MDT members about how to better identify victims of human trafficking, victims of child abuse, victims of domestic violence, um, that's so vital, it's so necessary. If we can't identify victims, we're not going to be able to provide them with supports and resources and interventions um, that they might need. So that is, of course, absolutely huge. Um, and educating our frontline workers and citizens. Um, so I can speak to the work that I do in the anti-trafficking field. We know that a lot of sex trafficking victims engage with financial institutions, with banks. So they might go to a financial institution or bank with their pimp or trafficker, and they might leave, and certainly very, very common that they wouldn't be identified by somebody like a bank teller in that moment, or they're going to a hotel so often um, and going in and out. And there's a number of suspicious red flags that could be identified, but the workers um, in those positions, citizens, Uber, Lyft, right? People are just aren't educated around um, these issues, right? Not a lot of people. Um, so just thinking through how can we better train our MDT members, and then also expanding that, how can we train people that we might not initially think are really engaging um, with this population? So continued solutions. Prevention education, of course, is really huge. Um, we can identify or we can educate people, our MDT members, our community, about how to know the red flags. But we also really wanna educate children on knowing red flags for themselves. What is a safe touch? What is an unsafe touch? So they can express that. Um, so prevention education, certainly for children, for teens is absolutely huge, especially now as we see a lot of kids being very isolated and very much spending a great deal of time on the internet. 
how can we talk to kids and teens about internet safety, especially when we know um, that perpetrators and traffickers are getting smarter and more in tune with what's going on at the internet, knowing how to exploit and manipulate already marginalized and vulnerable populations. So prevention education is absolutely huge to equip people um, to understand and know when they're being victimized is really big. Public awareness campaigns on a national and local level, um, putting education out there about hotlines, about local resources. Um, a lot of places, sometimes I, I feel like we have a lot of local resources, but sometimes people just don't know about them, right? I think that we could always have more resources. I would make that argument, but um, sometimes I just think folks aren't, aren't really aware about what resources we have in our community. So it's always certainly important to educate people around that. Um, and I will say again, since I created this presentation, there have been a lot of public awareness campaigns. Um, FIFA, if anyone here is a fellow soccer fan, they launched a huge public awareness campaign around being safe in the home um, and about domestic violence. So um, we've certainly seen a lot of things on like a global scale and a local scale, which is really encouraging. So the last uh, piece of the solution that I'm gonna touch upon is the idea of expanding social safety nets. Um, cash transfers have been found to be really effective at reducing IPV and child maltreatment. And we've seen this in both countries that are quote developed countries um, as well as undeveloped countries. Um, I don't love that terminology, but um, for the sake of the presentation, people know what I'm referring to. Um, paid sick leave, tax relief, and really understanding that we want to reduce the barriers as much as possible to access uh, these social safety nets, um, the direct cash transfer, because somebody within the home um, who is perpetrating that violence might make it very difficult to, to access those things. So keeping that in mind as we come up with a solution for um, providing better social safety nets for, for vulnerable populations. And then long-term just thinking, We've identified through past events that are somewhat similar to COVID and through COVID, this is a huge pandemic. This is a huge issue, the, the shadow pandemic that's rising up. So thinking through how can we incorporate um, program programming to combat violence against women and children into our long-term uh, pandemic preparedness. There's certainly a need for that and something uh, to think through, especially as this anticipated second wave of the virus is going to come. Um, what have we learned through the first wave that we need to be doing to prepare um, for the second wave? So um, I just want to sort of wrap up on this note with identifying some signs. I feel like I would be remiss to be talking about um, what we can be doing and solutions if I didn't take some of this time to just provide some information about knowing the signs, right? So I talked about this feeling like a very big issue, um, feelings very weighty, like, oh, what can I do? This is so pervasive on a global, on a national, local level. One of the things that we can absolutely do is know the signs and know our resources. Um, so just taking some time to know the signs of one child maltreatment and then domestic violence, and then providing you with some resources before we wrap up. Um, so child maltreatment, whether this is maybe children, if you work with children in your capacity, um, if you have children, friends, family, like knowing these signs is really important and then knowing what to do if you suspect. Um, so a child who might be excessively anxious or withdrawn from things that they used to find a lot of joy and amusement in, um, if the child doesn't seem overly attached to the parent or caregiver or might sort of exhibit signs of fear of the parent or caregiver, if the child is acting inappropriately adult-like, taking care of others, things like that, or sort of inappropriately childlike, like if they're in a further development stage and they're still throwing tantrums or bedwetting or things like that, sometimes that can be a sign of abuse in the home. If the child is constantly on alert or very watchful, uh, injuries or unexplained bruises, their hygiene is consistently poor. Um, that might be a sign of neglect, being frequently late or missing school routinely. Um, a big one, a big indicator of sexual abuse in children is that if they have a greater knowledge than is appropriate of different sexual acts, and if they're um, maybe talking to other people 
about that. That's always um, a big red flag. And same with sexual abuse. If the child is having trouble walking or sitting, um, that might also be an indicator. So these are, these are just things to keep in mind. So some signs for domestic violence that more so apply um, to adults. So if the individual is increasingly isolated from friends, family members, or peers, if they are really restricted from making their own decisions, whether that is about spending their money, um, where they're working, what they're doing, attending school, um, oftentimes the power and control dynamics are very, very intense. Um, like I mentioned, the finances being controlled. If you're seeing signs that their partner seems to show extreme jealousy, if they're very insulting, shaming, um, intimidating of an individual, that is definitely a sign. Um, again, unusually fearful, anxious or depressed behavior, and then of course, physical injuries like burn marks, uh, head injuries, broken or fractured bones, bruises, um, those are certainly all signs. So if you do suspect signs, um, what do you do? So knowing the resources is really, really huge. There are a lot of different local resources and I didn't include them in this presentation um, just because I'm not sure where folks are attending from. So certainly there are a lot of different resources in Bucks County. I believe there's a woman's place and NOVA, the network of victim assistance. Um, and I will say in Montgomery County, there's Laurel House, the Women's uh, Center, Victim Services Center of Montgomery County. Um, they all provide victim services. Um, but speaking on like a national level, you can always call the National Sexual Assault Hotline, which is written out right there. The National Domestic Violence Hotline, and again, there are county specific hotlines as well. The National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, and I will say we do have a, a program in Montgomery County in Philadelphia County, the Salvation Army, a new day to stop uh, trafficking program. They have their own hotline as well. And I will just drive home the point that anytime you suspect child abuse, call Childline. Sometimes people are afraid of their repercussions, um, but you're an anonymous caller and making the call is always better. Erring on the side of making the call if you have a suspicion. Because if it's if it's not sure, it's, it'll be unfounded. Um, so just always err on the side of making that call because you're not sure that you could save a life if you make the call. Um, I would just say there's a free darkness to light training that can be provided online if you're in Bucks County by Nova Bucks. In Montgomery County, Mission Kids can also provide free darkness to light training. And really that training is if, um, maybe you've seen this presentation and you want some more information around how to identify child abuse, either for you personally, um, for a civic organization that you're a part of or, or anything, um, just reach out and you can get some more intense training around those things. And I will say, and this is the last thing I have here, is that the Safe to Say hotline was newly developed um, by Josh Shapiro in the uh, Attorney General's office in PA. Um, and they created this really incredible hotline, which can be shared with kids and teenagers where they can make reports if they feel like they're unsafe um, or their friend is unsafe. And so they can disclose that, whether it's through text, um, they can call, there's an app. So this is a really, really great resource, especially considering the research that I mentioned earlier about um, kids calling the sexual assault hotline. So this is really specific to engaging um, with, with teens and kids who might need that support. So that is all I have. Thank you, Hannah. That was, that was really important. Really important, a very serious topic. Uh, very important for us to hear that. Um, I wanted, we wanted to open for questions. And if you have any questions for Hannah, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with a question. Um, I was wondering, given limited resources, how is it that professional services prioritize? Like if they get, if they get, or if you have any, if you have any, um, clue as to as to how they prioritize when they get calls in. Um, and if you could 
also clarify whether the increase in percentage of reports, are these new reports or are they repeated reports? If you have any, I don't know if you have any information um, on these statistics. So in terms of the increase in number of reports to different hotlines, do you mean like, are these totally new victims or these totally yeah. new cases? That is a really great question, which I don't know the answer to. Um, I think in terms of like confidentiality clauses, that would be something that's really, really difficult to track. Um, but I think that's a really interesting question. And I think as probably grant reporting is put out there following all this, that might be something that we can track because we track like how many um, calls come into the hotline and things like that, whether I think you can track like if they're a new call or not. So I think as data comes out, we'll be able to find more of those answers, but that's a great question. And I guess that goes back to my other question regarding regarding prioritizing. Mm -hmm. You know, whether new, it, do you have any information on what gets prioritized when there are limited resources? My understanding is that the cases that are prioritized are probably those cases which are crisis cases. Okay. Um, so cases where there has to be immediate law enforcement intervention um, or there is the experience of homelessness and so not just like housing instability. So things that require a crisis and um, reaction are probably prioritized. But I will say um, that a lot of times there's such good collaboration among partners and I can speak to Montgomery County. Um, that if maybe somebody doesn't have enough resources, they can refer them to, to a similar organization. So there's some overlap. So we see great collaboration between sexual assault, uh, human trafficking, um, domestic violence. If they don't have the resources, they can sort of reach out to other organizations for support. Hi, Hannah. Great, great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, I was wondering if, uh, given that, you know, students have been doing online uh, classes for a long time, uh, as uh, they are coming back to classrooms and as they're even coming back this semester, even if they are online, do you know if there's been any training whatsoever of teachers on uh, maybe better techniques for trying to identify any signs of, of child abuse, even in an online environment? That's a great, great question. I'm not sure in terms of specific training tailored to COVID and in engaging through an online format, but I will say, and I might need to double check on this, um, there's a law that was put into place recently where um, counties across PA are required now to have prevention education of child abuse. Um, so we see like at Mission Kids, we have a program that we're continuing now and that we've adapted online where our prevention educators training teachers and all of their students on a zoom platform and doing body safety and prevention education which is really really incredible and they've trained dozens and dozens of schools in the area which is really encouraging i would think there would even be a lag time for students when they they do get back into a classroom for the the teachers to once again get a feel for what is normal for any given child uh, so that they can identify when there's something that's amiss. Yes, we're uh, people in the child welfare field are anticipating that once kids are back in the classroom, that kids are out again engaging with other adults, that there will be a sort of surge um, where people are sort of bracing and getting ready with resources, knowing that there will likely be an increase in um, the number of reports once once kids are back in school. So here's a question from, from an attendee. Um, has the domestic abuse, child abuse situation improved over the past few decades in your opinion? Are there more resources than ever before? Has the frequency of abuse decreased? Is it impossible to tell? <laughs> That's a really big question. That's <laughs> a great question. I appreciate you asking. Um, I would need to go over a lot of data and look for a lot of trends. It's so difficult to make a very strong statement either way about that. I will say, I think that there are a lot of really great resources, especially in light of, of recent movements like the Me Too movement, um, since the Jerry Sandusky 
case broke in Pennsylvania, we saw a huge increase in this sort of child advocacy center model. So we've improved our responses to child victims um, of child abuse, currently in the process of improving cases of res our responses to child sex trafficking, um, different things like that, where I feel like people are talking about it more, um, which maybe is increasing the number of reports we're getting, right? So it's a difficult thing to weigh looking at the data. But in terms of your question about resources, I feel like I could say that I think there's been an overall improvement um, in terms of, of the resources that we can offer uh, victims of domestic abuse and child abuse. Any other questions from, from our audience? Hannah, I saw that you uh, cited some, some sources from the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'm curious, is there any information from the WHO on reacting to pandemics? And do they specifically point out that this is an issue that has to be part of a national response? Yes, yeah, they do. I, I definitely got a lot of uh, research from the World Health Organization, and they do point out um, that it is that it is an issue and it's a growing concern. Um, I will say the United Nations has a lot of really good information as well about how to formulate a better response to the issue as well. I have a quick question. You said you you cited um, that there is a notice noticeable decrease in gender equality um, in regions that have been been impacted by diseases, and I think that that's kind of interesting. And I guess I'd do you know what uh, variables they're using to determine gender equality? That's a great question. I would need to look into that a little bit more, but I think, and I think some of the variables mentioned in the research that I was looking at were in regards to like education of women and how often um, women are enrolled in school for how long and like literacy rates, but I'm sure there are a lot more variables, which that, I mean, that's a great question. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Okay. Um, so another question from the audience. What paths are there for the abusers? What degree of resources are available for recuperation, mental health, et cetera? Um, improved response for, for re-entering society? Such a good question. Um, wow, I, I wish I had a really comprehensive answer to give you. And I, I certainly think that this could probably be in another entirely different presentation. Um, my field of focus is victim services. So it's difficult for me to speak to this, but I will say, um, I will say that there are certain programs, reentry initiatives I can speak to in Montgomery County. Um, and we also see a correlation a lot of times between people who have themselves been victimized and, and later perpetrate abuse. So um, we are in the works of trying to address programs for youth with problematic sexualized behavior, which are very often labeled as perpetrators, um, but frequently uh, youths with problematic sexual behaviors have themselves experienced victimization. So trying to think about how do we focus on rehabilitating these issues rather than criminalizing them. Um, and it's such, such a difficult question. And I will say um, there are some programs in Philadelphia. JJPI has a couple of programs for um, people who have committed offenses um, to rehabilitate them. I think they have like a sex buyers program different things like that, but such an important point about rehabilitation of people who have committed abuse. Really good question. Thank you, Hannah. All right, do we have any more questions? Let's see, we look like we might have one more here. That's just from Tanya saying she had to leave. <laughs> uh, any more questions? Well, I think, oh, we got one more here. Let's see. 
Not a question, but thank you so much for this presentation. This is a crucial issue that is very personal to me. Well, thank you very much for, for making that statement. We really appreciate it and thank you for attending. Appreciate you sharing that. All right. Well, I think that might be it for today. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm really curious to see what will, will happen as schools kind of come back into sessions again and see, uh, you know, that I hate to say that we will anticipate that bump in child abuse cases and uh, uh, perhaps, you know, between the the hurricanes and other items that have brought forth these kinds of issues that will become part of a national plan and that, uh, you know, health organizations from the local level all the way to the federal levels will, will keep this more in mind and, and be prepared to deal with it and to support the activities that need to happen as well. Yes, I so very much agree with you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, uh, really appreciate you spending time with us today and all of you in the audience for coming today as well. Take care. And I hope you join us for other One Health presentations coming up this week. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.